While in college, I started a fund to invest in stocks and equities. And I built a fund, a seven-figure fund. The goal is something that is currently happening at the moment, which is to build. That in my mind, that's what's important to me, is like, I built that thing. So I was calling in and making trades of $100,000, $200,000 in between classes. People were happy with the results. I would get commission. It wasn't only capital allocation. It was like, I want to get one day to where I built that. Welcome to the Grit.org podcast with Colby Harris and Brian Harbin. In these episodes, they speak to top achievers in athletics and business to understand the habits and mindset they apply in order to build more grit. I can! I can! I will! I will! I'm going to! I'm going to! All right, welcome back to the Grit.org podcast. My name is Colby Harris. Alongside me is Brian Harbin, and we're here today with Roberto Bologna. Roberto, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, guys. Colby, Brian, thank you so much. Absolutely. We're super excited to have you here today. So Roberto actually immigrated in 2003 to the U.S., uh, went to college at FIU, and then broke into the real estate space. Ever since then, he has grown upwards of a nine-figure portfolio with his real estate capital firm. We're just thrilled to have him here today. He actually made the flight up today. Yeah, yeah. Pretty good flight coming up here. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. I slept a bit, gave me a couple of ideas when coming on the show. So uh, I'm ready. Well, what do you think about Jacksonville? You know, you like coming I, up here every now and I, again? I think I've been here once before. Um, you got to show me around. I mean, I only took the Uber here and that's about it in the studio, which looks great. It looks amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just go ahead and let's go just start from the beginning, Roberto. So you came in the States in 2003, just like I mentioned. Tell us more about your younger years, where you're from and what that was like growing up in a different culture. So, so I'm from Venezuela, uh, which is... Um, it's a different culturally place than the U.S. Um, great people as well. Um, but I think uh, the underlying um, thought process in uh, Latin America, uh, subconsciously for everyone, is, is let's have fun, let's party kind of thing. So it's similar to an Italian style culturally. Uh, the U.S., in my view... I'm not an expert like you're, a, I mean, I don't want to go into like, uh, you know, backgrounds of cultures and stuff like that, but the U.S., they of course love to have fun, uh, no doubt about that, but it's more like a Germanized culture, like very organized, like very to the point, like very, uh, and that, that I think it's part of what makes the U.S. so special in, in how capitalism has been able to thrive I think here in the U.S. and giving opportunities to me, to people like me that immigrated from Venezuela, and and made something really out of of uh, of a lot of work. Mm. Let's just put it like that. So, so I was born in Venezuela, uh, and then I I moved when I was eight years old to Ecuador. So, so my family did travel a bit. So that made me have lots of friends in different places and understand differences in cultures. So different countries in Latin America will have different cultures, maybe types of food, maybe the, the accent, how they talk, but it opened my mind uh, as far as uh, things could be this way or that way, people could be this way, that way. So um, that, is, that is really my upbringing all the way to uh, where I was from. And then from there, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, there was a time I was 15, my parents are like, you know, um, we're going to move to the U.S. for different reasons, you know, and, and I was excited, actually. Like, normally, if you would get that type of news when you're 15, you're a teenager, you're in high school, you're like, hell no, I'm not going to go to the U.S. I could care less. We would come here for vacationing, right? But that's one thing. You can go to a Disney World and have fun, come back. But to me, in my mind, because I moved when I was eight from Venezuela to Ecuador, it was like almost like part of it. Like I, I, I knew I was gonna go. It was a different language. I didn't speak uh, English. Well, I, I spoke English really, but but it all felt like a movie, honestly. Like when you watch, I want, I'm trying to think at the time of the types of of movies that were popular. There's uh, 
it's coming to America. Yeah. <laughs> and then I like to literally. Yeah. Oh, that was, yeah that's, no, that's a good movie, actually. There, yeah, yeah, the second yeah, one absolutely. just came out, actually. Uh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty good. No, no, no. He's no, stunned. But, He's stunned by a lot of the stuff that you're talking about. Yeah. Just like the, the, the rage of it, kind of all the people, the straight to the point. He's yeah. like, everyone's so fast. Everyone's yeah, yeah like, hey. 100%. percent. No, but, but I was actually excited when they told me, like, we're going to, like, and I was, all my friends, we got together, like, this is a farewell kind of thing. But to me, it was like a party and, and everyone, um, there's some people that were getting sentimental. I'm like, don't worry about it. Like, I'm in the US, like you guys can come anytime, whatever. And it didn't really feel, it didn't really hit me because when you're a teenager, hormones and, and, and things like really, it's different. When you're seven, eight, you're still a kid. You'll, I, I used to go back to Venezuela often, but, but in the US, uh, I think after four or five months, I'm like, oh shit. Like all my friends, I, I, and, and then I'm 35 now, so that was 20 years ago. Then you didn't have WhatsApp. Like I could make phone calls, international phone calls, and but but it wasn't the same. It's not like let's go out and, and let's go, uh, I don't know, to the beach, to let's go uh, bicycle around, like, like none of that. So different language. When I came in, uh, I did, it was the transition between 15 and 16. I think it was sometime in the summer. And then I did only my senior year of high school here. And, um, and then, you know, I just started adapting. Like, like, um, I, like I said before, like it was all like a movie. I, and I'm trying to think, I have in my head, the image of the movie, can remember the t crazy about you is the, is the movie. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Uh, Heath Ledger was in that movie. Uh, Rings a bell. But, but yeah. it's like a high school type movie. Like you're too young. I don't know, Brian, if you and I are contemporaries, uh, but, um, yeah, it was, it was. So yeah, was tell, like so I'm 43, so I'm a little bit older than you. And I can relate to that too. I remember, you know, backpacking to Europe, going to Spain and like what people take naps in the afternoon, these siestas yeah. from two, I'm like, yeah. this is brilliant. So, but yeah, what were some of the adjustments you felt like you had to make going from kind of more of a laid back culture to one that's a little bit more serious? Yeah, no, I, I think at that age, you're, you're going through a routine of, of high school, then going to college. I was the first one here in the U S to go to college. And, and, um, I think the great thing that made me merge or, or have that not so much of a cultural shock is that I landed in South Florida. There's a lot of you know, Latin Americans in South Florida. So in a sense, everyone that's in South Florida, maybe Venezuelan or from Ecuador, Colombia, Argentina, everyone's like, Let's, we're, we're, we all look at each other like, you know, we're a pack, we're from different countries, but we, it's so, so when I went to college, um, when I went to college, I, I just bonded with, with different people from different countries. And, and in Miami in particular, there's a lot of partying, Latin party, you know? And uh, I think that, that in, in a sense, through the college years made it, and again, I don't want to say that it was like a culture shock where I felt alienated or any of that stuff. Like I, it was always exciting for me. Like my attitude, because I had the background of moving from country to country, it was, it was exciting. And it was, I was meeting people from different countries and all this different stuff. And, and so that, that really didn't culturally, I think it wasn't until I got serious when working and, 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 and doing all the stuff that I'm doing now, because I deal, um, I'm dealing with uh, U.S. citizens, uh, uh, in, in, in not only from South Florida. So these are born and raised from New York, different culturally, completely different than Florida. Okay, uh, and and from other types of individuals, and and um, it wasn't until then that the way of communicating, I'm like, okay, this. I have to get more into the pulse, into the rhythm of communicating at these levels to, to, to really convey what I want to convey. Because when you're in business, it's quick, it's to the point is, you know, um, it's straight and, and it has to be in a way where it's elegant and it's not, you know, it's not like dry mm -hmm. when you do it. So, so yeah, so that's, so speaking of communicating, like you said, you came to the States not speaking any English, correct? I, I knew some songs. 
Okay, <laughs> I, I could, I could, by the way, that's so tricky because when you live in a Spanish speaking country, you listen to the American songs go all over the world and you sing them. And in, it's not until you move to the US and you actually, uh, you know, understand the language fully, you're like, oh, that's what I would, what it was saying. And you were singing it for 10 years, <laughs> like the Backstreet Boys and all that stuff. I'm yeah. like, I'm like, you know. <laughs> Just now figuring out what they're yeah, yeah, talking exactly, about. Honestly. <laughs> Uh, so tell us more about that. Just, you know, you now speak four languages, correct? Kind of yeah. par partially. I, 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 don't, I, yeah, I, I, I don't say that much, honestly. Um, I, Spanish is my, is my first language. English, and, and you know, I even have an accent, which to me, it's perfectly fine. But uh, and Portuguese as well. I'm, I'm fluent in, in Portuguese. But when presenting myself, that's one of the things that, you know, I learned throughout is it's not like, hey, I can speak. As a matter of fact, I, I only speak English and people of course notice my accent. And I'll tell you, you know, I speak Spanish, but I never say either Portuguese or Italian or any other stuff that I, that I understand. Um, but if it does evolve and I do get a close relationship with someone, I, I go ahead and, and, and do speak in that language. But I think in the first instance, I don't, it's not like if in a specific language, uh, like Italian, I have an Italian passport. Okay. So my family comes from Italy and, um, and my grandfather speak to me in, in Italian always. Uh, but I don't say I speak Italian because then you'll find one of the things that happened to me with those languages thing. Sorry, I'm taking a little bit on this, no. but I thought I knew Portuguese. Okay. And I was at a business meeting and which told me, Oh, you speak Portuguese. Yeah. I speak Portuguese. And it was like fully on Portuguese. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck just happened in there. Like, honestly, like I, I, I left that meeting. I left that meeting and I'm like, I, I don't even know because when you say you speak another language, you best speak it, especially mm. with the types of people you're introducing yourself because it's not the same uh, to just say a couple of words or sentences or if you go to France and you know order uh, something at the restaurant than actually going all in, all in. So, so I refrain from, uh, from saying I speak so many languages. So it's English and Spanish and then Portuguese, I can speak of course in Italian as well, but Keep it's it not like pocket. I'm not promoting that in right, any right. sense. Where you, yeah. yeah, no, I could definitely understand, especially when, you know, it might be the first time meeting some of these yeah. guys too. And, and you kind of fumble your words or you just have to stand there and just tell them like, I got no idea what you just said. <laughs> no, and, and it's always, and I, I do understand a lot, right? And so, and I, I could speak, you know, um, but it's always even better when they do speak that language. They don't know you do speak it. And then you're like, you don't have to say anything. You're just listening. That's right. all. Yeah. So let me ask you this. So, you know, being here in high school as an immigrant, I guess, what were some key skills that you developed that you feel like really helped you kind of assimilate into the culture? Um, skills, um, you know, I think, um, that's a, that's a good question, uh, about the skills because I'm, I think, uh, the way I interacted with people, um, that uh, being open-minded, you know, I, I'm trying to think of a particular set of skills as if I had it strategically planned, which I don't think I did. When you're an immigrant, you're basically on survival mode. You know, you are, um, you, the closest you can get to, even if it's one friendship, that is your world at that point in time. Uh, but I was, I was 15, 16, um, then going out to college. I, I do think that, that being, um, friendly and in understanding and, um, respectful to others was something that, because you're, you're dealing with different cultures, even in South Florida, it's not like I was going to Ohio where probably it's, it's all Americans mm -hmm. kind of thing. I was not only dealing with Americans, but I was dealing with Argentinians, Colombians. So you're talking about all these different things. So I think one of, if I wanted to say like a skill, like, uh, is, is the fact that I was adaptive and, and, and opened minded about different people. And, and today when I travel, uh, I travel often, very, very often. And, um, I was in Mexico a couple of weeks ago, I was in Vegas, uh, you know, into Israel, like, like 
different places. And you, every time I meet someone, I, I do it with a sense of respect for them and, and where they come from, regardless of, of their background and their social status. Um, because you don't know what they know, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it all depends when, when you walk. So, so I think, you know, to answer the question as far as skills, um, go, I think it, it was, it was being respectful, grateful and, and, um, socially open-minded. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I think that power of neutrality would be super important for people that want to network and meet people. It's like, you know, you can't necessarily immediately bring your predetermined opinions right. or outlooks right. into that conversation. Like you kind of yeah. have to backseat that and just go in and figure out, you know, who this person is in yeah. the first place. Um, so this actually, this is a world cup year right now. I meant yes. to ask as we were kind of getting so started in the episode, did sports play any part in, in this transition yes. in your early life? Yeah, no, I think, I think part of, and I love by the way, your message, uh, as far as being mentally uh, healthy, you know, like, and, and I think the part that you're asking about the, the sports, I think it's so important for anyone that wants to be successful, optimistic uh, about life and about the future, you know, uh, because everyone's gonna find situations where they have bumps in the roads. We all have problems, personals or professional. And, and the physical aspect, even today, listen, I don't play as I used to, uh, or I don't exercise as I used to, but I put my exercise, even if I'm in the office, I'll do some push-ups. you know? Like it's part, it's so, it's like a subconscious of, of uh, incorporating the physical into, into the mental. It's like it's connected, it's, it's, a, it's a stress reliever. So, but going back to that question, um, I played baseball, being from Venezuela, which is a major sport there, and I did play soccer. And on the baseball aspect, um, when we moved from Venezuela to Ecuador, uh, in Ecuador, baseball is not a big thing, but uh, me being from Venezuela, I was a big thing for baseball mm -hmm. in Ecuador. <laughs> so so I was uh, selected by the national country and I played the, the minor league uh, games, wow. play against the US, we traveled to Mexico, Nicaragua, all these different places to play. We didn't, as a team, uh, place very high in these tournaments, uh, but it was good exposure. And and listen, I, I do remember playing baseball, even when I was, this was, I was 11, 12, 13 years old. And I do remember playing against teams where I thought, me uh, being a little bit, you know, uh, ambitious or whatnot, and coming from Venezuela, I'm like, you know, I'll teach these guys in Ecuador how to, how to work this out. Which, by the way, there's really good players in Ecuador, really, really good players. And again, I'm a I'm a teenager. It's not like I was at professional levels, but um, I'll you know lead this team in these tournaments. And when you play the Dominicans, you're like you're like 13, and these guys look like 35, and you're like, bro, like there's no way I can hit that ball. Like I'm trying as best as I can. That curveball is or, or that you know whatever they're throwing. It was like. It was way it was, beyond it, No, no, I mean, it was, there was no 13 year old that could, you know, hit that. I think that one of those tournaments was won by Venezuela that I went to, uh, I think the US placed second on, on one of those. And then, um, yeah, the U.S. was always up there, either first, second, or third, something like that. And was that the original dream, be a professional baseball player? Um, I, I, don't know if it was like a dream kind of thing. Uh, it was definitely something I looked forward. I do remember some major league uh, baseball players I look up to and I, and I watch some of it, but uh, I, I remember Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire, you know, all these different players that were at the time like big, big things. And I used to have that tops, the cards, the baseball cards that you collect. And I think that it was at the time something really, really cool to do and, and uh, being, I'm, I'm the eldest of three brothers and we're all, I'm, I'm the shortest guy of the three. Okay. So like, and, and I used to get into, into fights with them, you know, like any other sibling until they got bigger. And I'm like, listen, we can, we can have some dialogue here going on. Um, and, but I think it was more 
the physical, like we needed uh, to get that energy out. And I was a really good student overall, you know, not straight A, but I was a really good student. Uh, but that physical aspect, I think I thank my parents in that regard for like, in a sense, in the beginning where you're a teenager, you have so many distractions, but encouraging to to go and, 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 and go after a sport, in this particular case was baseball, um, and going all the way to going to the national team, that that was, I think, in, its, in itself, at that point in time, probably a dream. Um, but then, but then um, I, I don't think, um, like, I pursued, in a sense, uh, like all the way, mm -hmm. and even soccer, I played soccer and, and even soccer at, at one point was a very high level. Um, and I could tell in other kids, even in college that they wanted it. Like they, I, I knew and I, in a sense you start like growing, you start like, okay, where do I allocate my time? Uh, and, and I knew when I was on the field, these guys had allocated their entire day to this while I was doing this, this, and that, all these different things. Yeah. Well, my wife and I, we have, we have three boys, and I can definitely attest to the fact that, you know, boys especially probably need to burn that energy out yeah. in order mm -hmm. to just- I've got two brothers, two you older know. brothers. Oh, yeah? yeah? Yeah. But I'm the biggest, so oh, yeah. I'm the opposite. Yeah. It's so it's similar, right? Yeah, I, well, I took, it took a lot of butt whoopings growing up, and then one day I woke up, you know, six feet, 200 pounds, and they're mm -hmm. still like little guys, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. that felt good for sure. Yeah. 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 So tell us about, okay, so this point you decide to go to FIU, major yeah. in mass communications and finance. Tell us about, you know, that decision or what you felt like you wanted to do at that point or? It, it was, it was, it was nothing. I didn't have culturally the, um, the plan to, to go out and what do you want to do in life? Like, listen, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was like 13, but I don't have the brains to be an astronaut kind of thing, right? But I think when, you, when I moved to the US, it's all again in survival mode kind of thing. You don't think of it that way because you're in a war zone or anything like that, but in your mind, you are in your mind. And now I can see that retrospectively because it's not like, listen, I, I had some friends or some enemies, all these different things, but like any other teenager or college guy, or whatever, it wasn't like anything where it's like a traumatizing story kind of thing. But when I went to college, I got a scholarship to go into college because at the time there's a test, the, I don't know if they still have it, the FCAT, something like that. And you, I'm sorry, not the FCAT, the SAT. Yep. The SAT and, and uh, SAT. you have like Bright Future scholarships yep. and these kinds of stuff. So I got that, so I studied for that. I've always been, one thing is very focused on tasks. So uh, even I, you know, I have a brokerage license and all that stuff. It's not my focus uh, in what I do, but you put me a test in front of me or put me something I have to do, I will do it. I mean, I aim to get the best possible grade or the best possible result. Uh, that is something that I've always had. So, but I think going into college, there wasn't a plan of, I, I knew I loved to read. I mean, I read, and there was a point I was reading like a book a week kind of thing. Um, and, and that was really my passion. When I spoke to a counselor, he's like, you know, you, you can be a journalist kind of thing. I'm like, okay, I'll, let, I'll be a journalist or something like that, right? You know, uh, but midway through college, um, I, then the thoughts started coming into my mind, like, okay, how old was I at the time? So I started college at 17. Let's say I was 19 or something like that. I'm like, okay, what do I do? What am I actually gonna do? How am I gonna pay bills after kind of thing? So that, so while in college, I started I started a fund to invest in stocks and equities. Started calling some people that, that I knew of, um, let's say family friends and people like that, uh, you know, not necessarily direct relatives and stuff like that. And I built a fund, a seven figure fund uh, while in college. I did not disclose this to any of my friends because at the time, we were all basically like uh, living meal to meal kind of thing. But it occurred to me, I've, I've always been aware of all these different things in, um, in how to, how I could get involved with the stock market in a sense. So I studied, um, and that's where the finance portion comes in, but in college, they don't teach you how to do this. This is more of, again, the survival thought mentality. Much more entrepreneurial. Yeah, for sure. yeah. And so um, 
I thought I, I studied how um, the reports they provide during businesses and stock markets on publicly traded companies. I studied how brokers made money uh, through it, through the commissions. And, and I said, you know, um, let me give it a shot. Let me, let me make a couple of phone calls, see if this happens. And, and, and soon after, um, yeah, I was, I, I created a fund and this happened 2007, 2008 while the debacle of everything. So perfect timing for a lesson in life kind of thing. But, but I raised those funds and while I was studying, I was still doing great in college. Um, and grade saying like a B plus kind of student, like don't imagine, I think I only made like the Dean's list once. Um, but because I think I, I get anxious, like I, if I get something, it gets boring, I'll just jump onto the next thing. Like it, I have to be in, in between classes. I was, I was at the time there was scotch trade and that kind of thing, but I was dealing with private banking. So I was calling in and, and making trades of a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars in between classes because you know um and and it was it was actually pretty good business you know people were happy with the results i would get commission i negotiated the commission um when when i did that fund because at the time i didn't have uh, a, a broker license to do that you need a broker a financial broker license to do that but i still did it you know and um and it all all of that dissipated oh, obviously when, when the 2007, 2008, you know, the collapse happened, you know, it was for, for the fund itself, uh, it was successful overall, uh, for me as well. Uh, but it taught me a lesson where if you, I can be in survival mode, but if I'm not planned, like the debacle of, of the, of the depression, 2007, the recession, I don't even know what it's called, but, um, it's a macro event. So you can control what's in front of you, but there are macro events where after that, when, after that happened, the trading in stocks got a bit different. You know, it wasn't as dynamic. The great thing that I was able to do while I did this, which probably was for a year and something, uh, is that the stock market was so dynamic that I was able to get in and out of pockets. This wasn't a long-term Warren Buffett type of strategy. This was basically looking at spreads and, 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 and making money off of that. And, and so, so that is how, you know, going back to your question, as far as, uh, you know, the planning of, of, of college and all that, it, it was like almost go kind of thing, you know, like, like um, uh, I, got, I had to get good grades for the scholarship. I had to, uh, I had to perform in this business that I had started, uh, and um, and then and then it just it just went along like that. Yeah, and <clears throat> that's pretty crazy to hear now to to be managing such a large fund. And like you said, I mean, I feel like times were so different to in the early, you know, before 2010. So many things were different of like how things are tracked, money, the way money moves, how much the IRS is gonna yeah. pay attention, things like that. But Coming into right after you graduated, you actually were working as an analyst before you got more yeah. into real estate. Yeah. Um, what do you think you learned there? And then what essentially led you to want to get out of that and start focusing more on real estate? Yeah, I think, you know, um, I, I had achieved a really high position at, at that uh, job. Uh, it was a, I was a global risk manager for a commodities trading company. Again, I study communication finance. Suddenly I see myself trading commodities. Like those are things that in life, like you go after what's offered. So I come culturally from a country where, I mean, don't have human resources for every company or you, or, or you don't have like a marketplace where you have many, many options. And I think the US or I think parts of the US are aware of that, you know, but when you come from a country where you best take what you have in front of you kind of thing. You best take what's in front of you. So in, in, in that case for me, and I'm, I was always an overachiever. Um, and I always had in the back of my mind that, you know, I have right now time in my hands. I'm young. Let me do all this stuff. 
they used to be go really, really early to the office. I mean, we're talking crazy early, like five, six, I, I had the keys to the office and I would go like out at midnight. I mean, even uh, to the point that I, I got so high in the company um, that so fast, so quick uh, in the company that um, this was a family privately held company, but that traded globally with offices in Brazil, Miami, LA, New York, Switzerland. Um, and that I was, I was basically at the highest possible level. And, and so because it was a family, uh, family owned business and it was like, um, it was a second generation family owned business. Uh, they were, they already had kids and, and some of the uncles had kids and some of that kind of stuff, um, that they were placing their, their, uh, kids or offsprings into this C suite level positions. Um, which by the way, some of them are really, really smart. But for me, I was like, listen, unless I marry someone into this family, like this is where I'm at this is it. And I could, I, I generated lots and lots of money for, for this company through trading, through different strategies. Um, but even if I thought of opening markets or different ideas for the company, I knew in my head, the ceiling was there and, and the ceiling didn't mean only the monetary part, because believe me, uh, part of my personal growth has been like when you guys interact between each other, you know, like everything is synergy, everything is, is, is energy. And, um, I used to be more of like, I'm here 14 hours or 12 hours a day. You are here eight hours. Don't tell me what to do because I already know what you do a hundred percent kind of thing. And, um, and for me on, on that, uh, personal level, I was like, starting to understand the synergies of the office, the, how to deal with people, how to do all these different things. And, uh, if there was an issue with the monetary portion, because initially of, of my attitude, uh, I would say it straight up, like, and I wouldn't talk to anyone at the office if I didn't get my salary raise. Like it was like that straight up. Um, so mentally, um, I think I knew my value, but I also, uh, was very wrong in different aspects of treating people the way it, not treating badly. I never treated anyone badly. I always respected people, but in a sense I felt because I spent more time and I was like really detail oriented about everyone that I didn't give a chance to anyone else to convey their, their perspective kind of thing. And so the monetary and then the personal aspect, and then and then it was just a matter of time. Like I was even talking to one of the family members, uh, one of the coworkers that was at my level. I'm like, listen, it's, it's, it's inevitable. Like it, it's, um, uh, it's not them, you know, uh, you knew it's, it it's, was it's, it's, it's me, you. it's me kind of thing. And, and, uh, in the sense, by the way, I, I left that company through the front door. Like we all keep very good relationships now, but, but at the time, um, uh, I was in the midst of negotiating, uh, equity in the company, you know, this kind of thing. And I'm like, I, I'm going to overtake the family kind of thing. Like it didn't feel right. Yeah. And so while at that, at this particular job, I had, uh, I had already, uh, started MB capital group and I already started, this was 2017. I already started traveling without telling this company I was working for during my vacation days to conferences, networking, started uh, doing a couple of deals here and there, very, um, very small in the real estate world, um, that by the time I had left, I resigned. Uh, and they asked me, they even asked me, you know, can you stay a couple more months? Yeah, sure, I can stay a couple more months. Well, I was already, I had this close at the time when I resigned that I had another company. I had already the fund started uh, while I was at that job. So, so I think that those different things, aspects in my mind, the fact that I put some value into myself, the fact that I was working harder than, than a lot of people, um, at least in the vicinity for the people that were around me, gave me more time because how much can you work all day? Like, I mean, there's so only so many, let's say commodity trades or any particular business aspects you can do in a day. You have to fill it out with something else. And that's when 
real estate came in through um, through an analysis I reversed engineering because I was an analyst. Um, I I thought, okay, you can make some money here, and and that's really how how it came down to. So yeah, at this point, you saw the opportunity in real estate, decided to kind of make that pivot. So what were some of the things that getting started you had to do in order to kind of get the uh, get off the ground in real estate? Yeah, so um, traveling, uh, meeting people. It was one of the things that I, I always- Residential or commercial or both? Commercial. Okay. Commercial. So residential deals I've done on my end. And I thought these are just so low hanging fruit, right? But these are low hanging fruit for like one and off kind of thing, not for a business plan, but commercial. Commercial is where where I started MB Capital Group. And I spent a lot of time traveling, getting to know, um, I'm gonna tell you a story about one of the things that happened. I'm building the fund, right? I'm raising money, which by the way, I had in order for me to raise money because I originally knew there was money involved in commercial real estate and, and how this was gonna go about it. Um, and and I was thinking of buying at the time from young brands, some different locations uh, throughout the country. And uh, the other option was a master franchise store. Uh, master franchise store is someone that owns, operates, doesn't own the building necessarily, but operates a large amount of uh, franchises from from specific brand, doesn't matter. In this case, it was like a Pizza Hut or something like that. And that was another option that I had. And on one of these conferences, one happens, I, th I think it still happens in Vegas or in New York, whatever. It's called the ICSC. Uh, it's a commercial uh, real estate conference. Thousands of people go there. And part of that is you get invited after, throughout the day, you're like looking at all these booths and you're talking to people and you schedule appointments, all of the above. But then at the end, everyone's in Vegas. So there's like um, an event, an after hours event at, um, I want to say the club is excess or something like that. Don't matter, but it's it's privately held. It's not like open for everyone. And um, I, I go when I went there and I travel and to pivot to to real estate and to do all of these R and D. Uh, I was going alone for all of it, and I was again being open minded and and trying to talk to people. Like naturally, some of us just want to be home, be a home buddy, and and then just like be to ourselves because that's our comfort zone. But, you know, I was like, okay, if I'm trying to achieve this, I gotta be, you know, continue to um, to explore. And I was traveling alone and all this stuff. And I was at this club, XS, and um, I was expecting someone there, okay, to meet with him. And this older gentleman next to me, uh, I think he was like watching some girls or something on Instagram, something like he was bored. I could tell he was bored and he was scrolling, uh, away. Yeah, scrolling uh, on Mindless. his Instagram. Right. And uh, I say, Hey, how's it going? And I started talking to him and uh, he just gives me his card and, and then talks for a little bit. And he asked me, what are you thinking of buying? And I'm, and he wasn't a broker or anything like that. He was, he was also a regional investor out in the West Coast, because people that go to those events are from all across the country, all over the world even. Uh, and he said, um, and I told him, listen, I'm, I'm between this and I'm between this master franchise store. And this guy, I don't know if he was lying to me. I don't know if he was telling me the truth. I just remember that the guy was just scrolling through girls that were, you know, half naked on this Instagram. Uh, like old guy kind of stuff, you know? And, um, and he's like, those guys are, are going under, like those guys are, are going bankrupt. And this is a random guy at a club. I wasn't even expecting meeting with this guy. I just talked to him. There was no evidence in the news, nowhere that this company was gonna go under that. I think they operated like, I don't know, 500 stores or something like that, very solid credibility, like all of that. And I said, it's a hunch kind of thing, like, I'm not gonna go with them. Like, but he, this guy stuck in my mind for some reason. And I didn't go with this. I didn't buy uh, buildings that were operated by this particular um, uh, franchise store. And, and so uh, I, I wanna say a year later, almost. Is that mine? I think so. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, and so I wanna say, I wanna say a year later or something like that, um, the, the, the company went under. Mm. The company went under, and um, and yeah, 
And so, so those are things where, where, um, and it, maybe I'm sidetracking a bit from, from the preparation to go into, into the, the fund and, and the planning I had to do and the pivoting. So it was a lot of time that I spent, um, meeting people, uh, by the way, that's not a good way to build a business plan. You're just going off God feeling kind of thing, but I had done a lot of data analysis on, on how this could be built. And, and, the, also the difficult part was raising money. Okay, so when you start raising money is how you convey the message of your vision. Because um, when I, at the time, I'm like most of us are numbers guy and we always say, oh, I'm a numbers guy kind of thing. No, you don't know how to express your, you know, your message. I was talking to people that I knew had invested with me in the past, may have been in, in, in that college fund or whatever. In, in, um, because I'm, I was always like in a sense, reaching out to people. And uh, when I tried to explain how these commercial deals were better than the residential deals, I was not conveying my message correctly. I was conveying the numbers correctly. And people would tell me over the phone, honestly, I don't know what you're talking about. I prefer to buy an apartment. And I'm like, I'm not a broker. Like this is building a fund. So get me like, listen, I don't wanna lie, but it's like 200 calls plus, you know, to people and I think in the beginning, the first individuals whom I thought this was gonna be an easy thing to raise money, because these people know me, or I'm gonna go into a couple of meetings and raise this money. And they're like, they were more confused leaving. They didn't tell me that. Uh, one told me over the phone. But but they, but they're like, yeah, no, like, listen, if you want, what if you, we buy a couple of apartments into this? And I'm like, no, like, you are not understanding. Um, and so that was really, really difficult in, in that regard. But I, I had already, I was at the other job at the time. I never thought of that as a backup income, but I knew it was a backup income. But at the time I thought, um, I'm not gonna leave this thing incomplete. Like just because the, all these different people had told me, um, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stop. So, so that is really how it pivoted. And when the money started coming in, when that, first guy that said, okay, I'm gonna give you, and it doesn't count until the money's in the account, yeah. you know? Then it was a positive, I'm like, okay, something's happening. Yeah, so what advice, I mean, one thing I've, you know, we've been in this room for 30 minutes together, but I can already tell you have a, a go, go, go mentality of like, you know, whether you feel that confidence or whatever it might be, like mm -hmm. clearly you run the numbers, so I'm assuming you feel probably naturally confident going in these scenarios, but what advice would you have for someone, whether it's breaking into real estate or it's leaving real estate to be an analyst, what would you say to someone who has that kind of like analysis paralysis, like they're so afraid of taking that leap? I mean, what, what advice would you have for that person? I would say, uh, don't have it, you know? Uh, well, you have all the reasons not to do things in general, in life, you know, if you're not gonna do them, I mean, you don't even have to analyze not to do them, you just don't do them. Mm. But but the thing is, um, someone that, that wants to start in real estate, um, I would say sweat equity is the key word. You know, you, you have to spend a lot of time, you have to get a pulse. Real estate is very regionally, um, you know, uh, oriented, so, um, my, the way I built my, my business is, is very, like you said, go, go, go crazy kind of stuff. But if I would look myself back, um, you have to get over that paralysis analysis kind of thing. You have to be able to risk, but it would be like focus more locally, get a pulse of the market, get sweat equity, even start with a real estate license or a brokerage license, that kind of thing. Uh, for you to better understand, because not everyone, part of my success is not only hard work. I've been lucky sometimes. I've been really, really lucky. I do remember one deal I was doing in St. Louis, uh, buying this building in St. Louis, and already the, the, the money was, all the deposit were, were already you know in escrow, but I, the timeline had already, the dil diligence period had already passed. So this was hard money already, a lot of money. And um, and I w had the financing, the commitment already in place as well. And like, I wanna say a day before the closing, title has everything the day before the closing, the bank called, I was doing that through a broker, I'm sorry. Uh, the finance I was doing through a broker. And the, and the broker, um, 
the broker tells me financing is a no go. And I'm like, what do you mean financing? We've been a couple of months in this thing. You didn't, what do you mean? Oh, the vice president at the bank says, um, these tenants you have are not corporate guaranteed or something along those lines. Like that was not part of, and I had never talked to the lender. It was all through the broker. This was a broker that was referred to me, never done any kind of business in St. Louis. I'm from South Florida. What do I have? So that's, you know, part of starting regionally. And I spoke to the vice president and uh, I, I asked him, give me his phone number. I asked him, I told him, listen, this is publicly traded. It's not as big as other companies, but it's still publicly traded. There's a corporate guarantee, so forth, so on. Um, and he's like, I'm going to review it. And I'm, what am I going to say to the guy over the phone? I'm going to say like, please, I have millions of dollars in the line. Like, please, like begging. No, like I, I put on like a, like, like a face of, listen, if this doesn't work out with you, I'm going to have to go with someone else. And it was a good amount of money. Lenders are incentivized after going through the underwriter are incentivized to lend. That is their business. You know, they made money on the originations. They made money. They, they get a spread on the interest, so forth, so on. And they have to expand their portfolios. And, um, and he called me, I think at night, like the amount of stress I was under, you have no idea. People entrust me with their money for me to execute. And the fact that I, at the last minute, I, I get this curveball. And then he calls me, he's like, there's a go, you, you're good to go. I cried, like, I, I'm gonna be honest, I cried because of the amount of stress. So those kinds of um, situations are, are uh, not something I would recommend for someone that's, because you get lucky. I'm sorry, I don't know if, if I was nice to this guy over the phone or whatnot. That is pure luck. Like the vice president just gave a go last minute. It was my mistake for, um, even though I had a commitment, a financing uh, commitment at the time, um, they can still pull out. And I had never, my mistake was that I never communicated directly to the lender. Instead I was, all my communication was through the broker. Uh, and so I knew where my mistake lied there, but anyone that starts in real estate has to start, that wants to do real estate, don't matter if it's uh, residential, commercial, it has to be locally. It could be through a successful brokerage in the area. If you, if you wanted to get contagious with that kind, or if they accept you at that brokerage, right? Um, or, or you can start with something small as well. It doesn't really matter, I think, as long as the determination is there. But the ultimately, I think, for me, the analysis paralysis portion is, it was never, the money was always, you know, part of it, but it was never the goal. Like, the goal is something that is currently happening at the moment, which is to build. One of the things that I always had in my mind was, like, we're currently sitting in this studio, and someone built it right? You can step outside. It's like, don't matter if it was like a huge company or not, but if you built it in my mind, that's what's important to me is like, I built that thing, you know, kind of thing. So that was what was important to me. And that was my, my why in the, in the real estate aspect. It wasn't only capital allocation. It was like, I want to get one day to where I built that kind of thing. And yeah. so that is, that is, um, that is a short for that analysis paralysis. <laughs> yeah. And is that, so is that kind of the formula for growth in terms of, okay, you have the money, obviously you did the analysis in terms of figuring out, it sounds like you wanted buildings that were going to be, the tenants were going to be, you know, large corporate companies with franchises and then just kind of a rinse and repeat that model. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, correct. That is, that is correct. Um, the, the first thing that always in any business is, is the actual analysis. Like you cannot, and, and the planning of it. Um, and I think it all starts with uh, either you're in desperation, survival mode, or, or, or you have an ambition, whatever that may be for you. But even if I said, oh, I wanna build building, is, is not like, uh, I, 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 you know, there, I'm gonna quote, I'm gonna quote uh, the the owner and founder of, of Sage Dental. I know him, uh, and um, and we were trying to do some type of business in out in Michigan. And uh, and at the time, he I was even though I had done some analysis on some data brought into the table, he's like, "Hey, you can't just have like can't do attitude." 
just got you got to do the work. Like I wasn't leveling up to that type of business then, uh, and that was in a completely different industry, not real estate. Okay, and um, and I think that even if you have all the will to do something, maybe through survival, through ambition, whatever. Once you have like, oh, I want to build a building or I want to start a business doing this or that because of this, you have to spend the time to analyze the data and to analyze the market and other businesses. I think the great opportunities that the US offers overall is that, that there's many industries that are so regulated, so regulated that your benchmark is already the same for everyone to start off. Uh, and then from there, you are in a sense unique to, to yourself, of course, but you try to benchmark off the other companies that are successful. And so the first step is always, you can copy a model and be in place. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of businesses I know without necessarily planning that become complacent and employ themselves are, are um, uh, sole proprietorships or whatever, it, it, they, they employ themselves through a business. They say they own their time. They, th they say they're businesses, but they're not really businesses. They just, they had a benchmark of the industry. They had a benchmark of competition and they really, they just replicated what happened. So, so for me, it was, it, that had to happen because I had no business in the beginning, naturally. And from there, I just started going leap upwards mm. into developing. Mm. So not only developing commercial real estate, like you said, you kind of didn't necessarily move in the residential area no. to start, but then you start getting into luxury real estate, a little bit more residential work. Tell us a little bit more about getting into that, what led you to do that and kind of what differences, or if you had to compare the two, kind of some things that you've seen. Yeah, so right now we have uh, our flag, Wi-Fi Money Capital. Uh, Wi-Fi Money Capital is the meeting of the minds, the merger of uh, Wi-Fi Money between Alex Miller, Chris Frederick, uh, and, and for those that don't know, Wi-Fi Money is a globally renowned company with these two individuals, young guys, uh, that have reached not only celebrities, uh, but have reached very important individuals uh, throughout the world overall that, you know, where they have these connections, Wi-Fi money, such a respectable uh, company. And, and I bring the real estate aspect. And so the meeting of the minds between us uh, was, um, while I started with the luxury aspect, it was like, how do we build brand with this? So this is what we have right now, Wi-Fi money capital. And the, the luxury space came um, through the fact that some individuals wanted to develop or buy luxury and the data comes in and I'm like, there's a lot of fat in here. There's a, as long as it's done correctly, you know? Uh, and so that is where the meeting of the minds happened. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the houses I'm developing now uh, is, is for, for Alex. Okay, and and you'll you will see some images in the near future, uh, with some crazy, crazy stuff. When I mean luxury, I mean ten million dollars mm -hmm. plus homes. Uh, this is a market where, um, in a sense, is it it doesn't compete against uh, median household incomes. It's a very niche market, and and I think luxury that's where the branding uh, is growing right now. Mm. So, and then tell us about kind of your, your day to day now in terms of like what, what your focus is. I mean, obviously this is a big part of the project, but, um, any other parts of the plan in terms of expansion or. Yeah. I mean, um, my day to day is really focused on how to grow the company behind, uh, closed doors. Um, the, the branding portion uh, is, is coming through the Wi-Fi money aspect of things and, and will come even harder through that portion. Um, my responsibility really is, is the performance aspect, 
of all of these homes and and how to build again we go into that benchmark of you can build anyone can build as a matter of fact people here can build their own homes uh, with home depot kind of thing like you mm-hmm. i think there's there's like someone that said like oh you can go to home depot and build your own home actually and like i think you can um but when you're dealing with with developing a brand a luxury brand um it's everything from the procuring of all the different materials, uh, the different subcontractors involved, and the time, and, and, and the customer experience. So all of those things. So I, I spend a lot of time um, making sure that machine works. I get a lot of phone calls a day. Um, I'm in direct contact with uh, the prime materials, the, the subcontractors, all of the above. Uh, one of the advantages I would say I have, which has nothing to do with business planning or anything like that, is is the language aspect in South Florida where anyone working in construction speaks Spanish. So I will, uh, from time to time, even once a week or twice a week, I would go to any of the sites where we're building because we own over 10 acres right now, only for the residential aspect. Um, which I don't know, here in Jacksonville, 10 acres is like, someone's house, just one house. But but in South Florida, you talk about those kinds of, of property sizes. Tighter. Just to give you an idea, in Miami Beach, homes that sell for $30 million have a 10,000 square foot lot. 10,000 square foot is a quarter of an acre. Yeah. And, and I am talking about here where we're building a minimum of two acres per home, mm-hmm. okay? Which uh, in South Florida, which, and I'm not talking like in the middle of nowhere, like this is, this is a lot of privacy and for a lot of uh, major sports player, baseball players, NFL players, uh, CEOs of large companies, uh, Fortune 500 companies. And, and so my day to day is making sure that the construction happens on time. Like I was saying before, if I go to the side, you know, I'll talk to the guys. Like I'm, let's say, I, I don't have the skill set to, to build like to those levels because we're talking about 14,000 square foot homes. We're talking about, you know, with tennis court, equestrian, you know, uh, and, and, but I'll talk to them. How's it going? What do you need? Like just in a sense that I'm in touch with what's happening on the ground all the time. And then, and then part of it is, is also um, in growing the brand is any company needs capital contributions and any developer needs capital contributions. So uh, that's also part of, of, of my traveling and part of the time where I consume. So that kind of leads right into my next question. I wanted to ask a little bit about, I mean, you think the mix here of like building your brand from the real estate perspective and who you work with, I mean, this kind of, again, it comes back to you and Wi-Fi Money Capital and the, the personal brand or persona, so to say, that you guys give off. So could you tell us a little bit more about, you know, what do you think has helped you succeed to you know, score these big meetings, to get the foot in the door, to be networking with such high-level individuals. Yeah, I think I think I've always felt that I belong. Okay, um, even uh, as an immigrant, I I felt that I belong, and and that is I know that there's some therapy or meditation things that people do um, where where you. Uh, you're part of a, like a bubble of happiness or something like that. Uh, I've heard of it, you know, uh, but, but, and then you go into a room and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm happy enough to be here. Kind of, something like that along those lines. Um, but no, I think for me, it's always been, I belong. Um, even rejected as a kid going from country to country and all that stuff in the sense, I was like always in your face and people were like, like you're you're different kind of thing because of the accent and all that stuff. But you adapt and you're like, okay, maybe I'm different in certain senses, social senses, but but I'm still here. You guys want to play or that kind of thing. And so one of the things is uh, if someone tells me you want to come to my podcast, I'll go. I don't know what I'm gonna get out of it, honestly. But maybe I learned something. You know, maybe I don't. Um, there's there's this thought where any entrepreneur, I think, I don't know where I read this, but uh, that any, there's a lot of entrepreneurships that fail. And with that time that you spent and failed, you could have been watched the entire Netflix, whatever, catalog, doesn't really matter. 
but you can still succeed kind of thing. So you can, it's a, it's a thing where whenever I get invited or I get a tip or something, I like to be bothered, you know, and I prefer to have a very, very tight schedule and, and do certain things that than to have time without anything in my hand. So, so I think that I started getting involved in, into different groups, different people invited me. And one of the things that I've always done is, you know, we can be friends uh, after this, you know, kind of thing. And then you suddenly introduce me to someone else. It doesn't mean that uh, I will stay with you in the sense of, because you introduced me to someone else, every communication I'm gonna have with someone else is through you guys. No, like if I met someone else and I get along with that guy. So I've been able to jump through different social circles where I am friends with many, many people mm. uh, or close to many, many people and gotten involved to uh, different groups where I'm appreciated and I'm part of it and they get me involved. And, um, and but to me is more of, of getting to getting to learn something new and something different and, and yeah and and being part of that yeah well i mean that's just kind of the what's so cool about business these days and relationships especially is what social media even offers i mean like you said with wi-fi million capital and alex and chris and you actually reached out to alex just to confirm yeah. i mean if i even existed <laughs> yeah, or, yeah. or that i was here and and even just from a couple phone calls with alex he was able to vouch and say yeah. you know yeah. definitely go on yeah, go say, talk to say him colby's all right yeah yeah <laughs> i'll take that from yeah. alex that's not no, bad no, at all he, no he was good he was he was pretty good he's like yeah that's good. Yeah. Like, so you know. same, same mentality. Like yeah. uh, it's cool to hear it from you, especially just given kind of the, the business that you've worked in to apply that. I feel like for people my age, especially so big, it's just like yeah. be a yes man in the, in the right regard, not like in an actual meeting, but if someone's going to invite you somewhere, that's mm -hmm. an opportunity and you should, you should definitely jump on that yeah. every chance you get. So kind of on that note. So like when you go to a networking event at Mar-a-Lago, for example, like, you know, A, how you get there, but then also like, what's kind of your mentality when you go in? I know you said you belong, but, um, you know, what's kind of walk us through that mindset. Yeah, so, so I, I've been there not, uh, for a networking event. I've been there invited. Uh, and, um, and I've been invited for specific meetings for dinner, specific things in particular. Uh, how I got to that, I honestly don't know. Uh, <laughs> that is such could never give a formula. No, for that. like like that didn't happen ever planned. Yeah. Um, and I've been there a couple of times, and I think um, again, one person invited me to a thing, and he's like, and I'm I'm curious about what you do, you know, and so I'm like, oh really, like this, and like, oh you should check out, like there's a there's someone I met. I want to say a year a year ago actually, and two weeks ago I was in Mexico and he texts me. I want you to check out uh, the new app I'm coming out with, you know. And and there's a developer. You have like the developer thing before it goes out into the app store, and I'm actually giving him feedback on that, but not because I'm a tech guy. Because I, I honestly like want him to succeed. And I'm curious about how he does it. So we're talking about programming and all this different stuff, which is completely separate from what I do. And um, that's that's really how I got to meet individuals that uh, you have seen, for example, in my Instagram and, and stuff like that. And there's a lot of people that I don't post about and I can't. But, um, uh, but that is really how I get invited. And I think for me, being in a place like Mar-a-Lago, if you separate the politics from it, like a lot of people automatically start thinking politics, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, you have to think uh, the president of the United States, I met him, right? Uh, and um, that, is, that is quite a responsibility for any one individual, being the president of the United States. And regardless how you feel of any political party, when you're there, it's gotta be exciting. Like, honestly, like it's, I'm a US citizen, right? Now, and I vote and all this different stuff, but uh, to me, I'm, I'm an immigrant. Like it, in a sense, um, you know, I, and as an immigrant and, and to the, the US is always looked up from, from countries that where, where I came from and, and the US is always like, we will follow in model of what the U.S. is doing. The U.S. is a pioneer, 
Okay. And, um, and being there and not only President Trump, I've met other individuals, um, if you want to talk about politics, like very high in politics and both parties. Um, and, and so to me is same attitude, like to learn and, and, and to, and one of the things is when you are with different types of individuals, um, it, it might be a different cadence in how you communicate, you know, like it, it's a different thing. Um, it's like an, um, unspoken understanding and, and you start to, to read people in certain ways. And so I think now I feel very, very comfortable to the point where I could have a lunch with a Senator of the United States. I can be at one of my job sites with people that are immigrants that need a job for, I don't know, $10 an hour or something like that, or, or I can be in all these different things. So, so I think, um, it's a learning, it's a learning thing. Get those that, repetitions. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it leaves me wonder, I mean, you know, now you, you said like you've always wanted to build the buildings and, and say like, oh, I built that. Well, now I'm sure you have a array of places you can drive by and say you built it, you know, probably got the cars you flew up just to come do this today. You shake the Donald Trump's hand, yeah. you know, a lot of really, really impressive things, that, yeah. you know, a lot of people that, a lot of things that many people would do anything to have a shot at, but we're here today and you're still talking about the same drive, same work ethic that you apply every day. What is it that keeps you pushing even as this so-called success has come along? Yeah, I, I don't think I'm there yet though. I, I feel of myself as if um, it, I'm not established hmm. yet. And, and I think I have in my mind a vision which expands, I mean, it does a lot in, in South Florida and what that has to do, but, but it expands a lot more in the real estate aspect. So I don't want to bore you guys with, with all that, but I would say that, that the reason I continue to be hungry about it is if you want to put factual about certain things is once you start making X amount of money, money is relevant. It's honestly, is irrelevant. So what do you have? What do you, what does any human try to find is issues they can resolve. Because if you can retire yourself in your thirties, I mean, you get into a depression. What are you going to do? Oh, I have money saved in the bank. I'm just going to uh, live off my interest. That is the most boring thing you can do in your life. I mean, come on. I mean, and, and, and I know retired people, not in their thirties, in their fifties, maybe the fifties is a different time, you know, but I know that people will say, okay, listen, I, I have enough and I can do all this stuff and okay, good, good. I that, that think that's amazing, but that is not all the success that has come to me has been, uh, early on. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I listen, every, Thing. I take a lot of risks when maybe I, someone that would be in my position would say like, bro, just chill. Like you, you're fine. Uh, listen, I, I, uh, so I try to keep myself, um, not only I have a vision of, of what, uh, I want to be able to accomplish. So I'm not there yet. And I always try to keep myself hungry. Never, uh, never in a situation where, uh, I feel I've made it kind of thing. Like I don't, I don't, I had those, I, I think it's good to celebrate uh, moments where you succeed. I think that is very, very important because those are times and places that will stay in your, in your mind and you can celebrate with your family. You can go out and party, whatever that may be, that will stay and you can do crazy stuff for that, that night or that day, whatever it may be, or that weekend. But then, um, but then after it's just to, to keep on grinding, you know, uh, in, and try to stay close to the ground as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Good. Yeah. Just uh, the, I think the perspective of it is the biggest thing, man, of just for me, you know, I'm 20 to sit and think like, you know, it's, it's kind of similar to what you're saying. Like the past year, you know, people want to like pat you on your back, tell you're doing a good job, but in your head, you know, there's such a bigger plan, a bigger, a bigger vision that, that you want to achieve. It's definitely, even though I might not have found that financial success yet, it's one of those things where it's it like will the, come. the process of it is definitely becoming more and more, you know, fun to paint that picture. And, and I think you're, you're very, very young for what you're doing. And, and I think that is great. 
you know, I think that um, you're taking a great opportunity. Um, and and as long as you keep on, on grinding, you know, uh, you put the grit uh, on it, the financial aspect always comes to those who work. Mm -hmm. Like, it, there's so there's so much abundance. It's a matter of choosing the different channels where you go after or the different risks you take. But there will be one time in your life, depending on what your choices are, where money will 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 find you. Mm. It's what you do with that at that point. But if you celebrate money more than the actual way you got to it, um, then that's that's your ultimate uh, event or situation kind of thing. But yeah. the financial at your age, listen, um, you're young, you know, 20, 20 is, 20 is young, bro. <laughs> yeah, maybe not, might not be running a million dollar fund yet, but. No, uh, but that's a different situation for everyone. Yeah. I Like everyone has a different, and it's like, yeah. Like I know you surf, right? Right. Yeah, so that's a cool thing, you know, like you never know where opportunities come, but, but I think at, at 20, I, it was, everyone has a story mm. and, and it's not like an ultimate place where everything's going to be happy at that point in time. I think it's more, it's more the process. Yeah, you know? definitely. Well, I really, really appreciate all your insight. I think just like you said there, that's definitely not something to be neglected. It's like some of these other things that you dabble in, whether it's like, like I really enjoy cars as well. And yeah. I actually met one of my favorite podcast guests to this day at a car show. He had a Pagani there and I was oh, like, wow. noticed he had a Jaguars plate. Um, huh. I Googled him up. Sure enough, he's from Jacksonville, runs multiple private practice offices and same thing. Just, you know, introduced myself, talked about the car. And then I brought up, Hey, we're on a podcast. Would, would love to have you on and tell your story. So it's really cool. Just like you said, like, kind of the way those opportunities follow. But just la one last question for you. Again, really, sure. really had a ton of fun having you here today. Was really looking Thank forward you. to it. As you know, the Great Creed is 12 principles we believe everyone could really yeah. live by. So what part of the Great Creed resonates most with you and why? Um, so I check all of the different uh, options I had. And, and I would say the one that I, that I would resonate with me the most is I will try and try and try again think that that is a grid for me you know i we're here and today i'm in a good spot financially personally all this different stuff um where where things seem like they're always gonna be fine but uh there's a lot of uh you know mistakes or busts that have happened uh and that's part of i will try and try and try again mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I think he's definitely applied that day in, day out to what you do now. So thank you again for being here today. That's a wrap for the Grit.org podcast. Please check out all our other episodes. Leave us a comment. Tell us something you enjoyed about Roberto's story. Visit BrennerCox.com. You can yeah. find a lot or of that wi work there. Or wi Or WiFiMoneyCapital.com. Share this with someone you think it would resonate with or impact. As always, we appreciate you tuning in for another episode of the Grit.org podcast.